Welcome back to Close Up. To start the year, we've been connecting with the leaders in the House and Senate of both parties. This morning, we get someone who wears a few different political hats, so we'll get to discuss state house issues and the first in the nation primary fight. Senator Donna Susi, the Senate Democratic leader, is our guest this morning. Thanks for joining us, Senator. Good morning, Adam. So I want to start here in your hometown, Manchester, uh, and the problem of homelessness, that everyone's trying to figure out what to do on this. I'm curious for your perspective, is this a responsibility of the city or does the state need to get more involved in what's going on? Because we're seeing this all over the state and municipalities. Well, I really think it's a responsibility of both. I mean, obviously these people are located here in the city of Manchester. The city has some obligation, but many of these people come from different parts of the state. Um, coming to Manchester in particular, looking to seek out services. And I think that's where the state could play an important role. In the last budget process, we tried to include more money for the different entities that are trying to provide shelter for homeless um, individuals, and we weren't as successful um, in that go around. And I'm hopeful that during this budget cycle, we can do more to support institutions like Families in Transition here in Manchester, which do a great deal of work to try to ensure that people aren't left out on the streets. Right, and, and there's a lot of frustration downtown right now with the situation. Uh, you're an attorney. What's your perspective on this idea that the city and the police just can't tell folks to move along, even though they are treating the sidewalk essentially as their own private property? Well, I think there are some potential alternatives. Um, that really is the city part of the issue, and I think the mayor and board of aldermen are trying very capably and ably to find alternatives so that people aren't locating themselves just on the sidewalks. But we have to remember that we are dealing with people, and these people are making choices for themselves. Um, and as long as the choices they're making are not violating or breaking the law, uh, we might not like the choice, but it is their choice. They're individuals. And what we need to do is discover what the reason is that they're choosing to live outdoors. Was there some trauma? Do they have substance use issues? Do they have mental health challenges? Trying to uh, tease that out of these individuals so that we can get them into the proper channels of service is what we really need to continue doing. And yet there is some law breaking that is part of the equation. Mayor Craig, as far back as 2019, identifying the 2018 bail reform law as one of the drivers of the issue here. In particular, uh, you have people committing thefts, uh, burglaries, other property crimes. It's very rare now that those people uh, spend any time in jail. And if they're homeless, they're again back out in the streets, potentially reoffending. Uh, I'm interested in, you know, this category of offenses is not up for discussion at the State House when it comes to changing the bail reform law. Why is that? Mm -hmm. Well, the bail reform law was put in place for the right reasons. Uh, we wanted to ensure that somebody who simply doesn't have a dollar in their pocket isn't sitting in jail awaiting trial for some of these more minor crimes. Uh, the problem was that we didn't have the infrastructure in place through the bail commissioner system and through the court system to properly evaluate some of these crimes. So that's why the focus has really been on those that commit violent crimes. I'm going to be sponsoring legislation. There are several other pieces coming forward to make some modifications to the bail reform law for that very reason, that we need to focus more on violent crime and on some of these other issues. Uh, we need to make sure that individuals are treated um, appropriately and that people are being held accountable for their crimes but are not being incarcerated unfairly. Mm -hmm. And you've been on the leading edge of this, uh, having seen what's going on in Manchester. I'm curious, why do so many Democrats at the State House want to protect the status quo on bail reform when you see things like th this man in Manchester out for a walk stabbed to death? Well, I don't think that's the case. I think the House vote was perhaps more partisan or appeared to be more partisan. Um, in the Senate, the final version of Senator Bradley's bill last year uh, had strong bipartisan support. And, you know, although our caucus was divided, the majority of Democrats even voted for that version of the law because we think we need to make those modifications for those very, very serious crimes. Let's talk about the primary and the months ahead. Uh, you're a DNC committee woman. Again, mentioned the many different hats that you wear. Uh, it, it's one thing to change the calendar, but the DNC really has set a financial trap for the New Hampshire Democratic Party. Um, what's your perspective on what could happen to your party if they follow through with all of these punitive measures they've set up? Well, first, let me say we're doing everything we can to ensure that the Rules and Bylaws Committee of the DNC, the DNC as a whole, sees that what they've proposed is unworkable and really unthinkable. I mean, it's, it's just a travesty that this has come this far. But we are working to ensure that uh, this situation is rectified. 
Um, you know, the DNC is asking us to make changes to state law regarding the primary. Uh, we obtained letters from the governor, from Representative Osborne, Senator Carson, majority leaders in both chambers, indicating that's not going to happen. We knew that wasn't going to happen. Um, and they're asking us to do things that they know we essentially can't do, given that we have a Republican trifecta in this state. So, you know, it's akin to asking your five-year-old to read at a fifth grade level, and when they're unable to do it, you punish them. Well, they're trying to punish New Hampshire for doing something that, number one, we can't do, and number one, we don't want to do. The fact of the matter is the Democratic National Committee didn't give New Hampshire its first primary. New Hampshire invented the primary. We've had it for more than 100 years. It works well, and our state law is in place, and I am certain that Secretary of State Scanlon will set a date before South Carolina if that's who the DNC determines comes first. Could these punitive sanctions hurt the ability of Democrats to win statewide races in 2024 and 2026? Well, I think that remains to be seen, but I do think that's a possibility. I think that the National Committee fails to recognize how important the primary is to people of both parties in New Hampshire. Um, I asked Governor Sununu to write a letter uh, to the DNC. It's something that he raised in his inaugural address. It's something that Republicans and Democrats, despite all the other issues, it's one thing that we are 100% um, in agreement on that we should have this primary and we will continue to have it and we're going to work towards that. You know, being in the room for some of that DNC Rules and Bylaws Committee meeting, I was struck by, um, you know, some of the comments about we need to move the first primary to a place with dirt roads and working people. Uh, one of the committee members referring to New Hampshire voters as, quote, college educated techies. It seemed like some of them had no idea what this state is about. I'm curious, how did it get to that point? I mean, you guys are there. Mm -hmm. How did you let them get to this point of having this conception of the state that's so far from reality? Well, I don't know that we let them get there. Um, I, I think they were ignoring the realities of New Hampshire. There are people throughout this state uh, that live on dirt roads uh, that have, you know, very physical blue collar jobs. Uh, we're not all techies uh, from, you know, the uh, Massachusetts area. Uh, in terms of our workforce. New Hampshire has a very, very different structure. The numbers of um, African Americans, the numbers of Latinos are not the same as those of South Carolina, but New Hampshire is a very different state. As I said to you earlier, one of the things we also have to remember is the diversity of the electorate is very important. The diversity of candidates and their ability to enter the field is very important. And here in New Hampshire, anyone with uh, $1,500 who wants to fill out a form can gain access to the presidential primary ballot. And that's really important. We want to make sure that candidates of you know, various backgrounds are welcome here in this state, and they are currently on both sides of the aisle. The DNC has targeted that, though, trying to essentially scare candidates away, saying we're going to punish you if you put your name on the ballot, we're going to punish you if your name gets on the ballot and you don't try to take it off. Does the legislature need to take any action to try to make it easier, to give candidates an end around, if you will, that will allow maybe ballot access and a ballot to look like the field, uh, but maybe help them not get in so much trouble? Well, I mean, there are different ways to attain ballot access. As I said, here in New Hampshire, it's very easy. Um, it's a lot more difficult in South Carolina because the parties actually determine who gets on the ballot, which candidates get on the ballot, um, and they charge a significant amount of money in order to obtain that. So I, I would say that in many ways, many candidates would be precluded from participating in South Carolina. Look, at the end of the day, if the DNC imposes sanctions on candidates, that's going to be up to the individual candidates. But we all know that the press is going to be here in New Hampshire. You're going to be front and center interviewing candidates on the Republican side because it'll be an open primary. And if there is a Democratic primary, uh, I would say that candidates are going to look to be where the press is, where they can make the most impact. So they'll be here in New Hampshire. Shifting gears back to the State House, what is the top legislative priority for Democrats in the Senate in 2023? Well, there are many. I would say that the reauthorization of Medicaid expansion and ensuring that uh, people have access to health care and, more importantly, that we have a healthy workforce. Because workforce issues are the number one uh, concern of businesses around this state. And we'll be hearing more about your agenda in the days to come. I know there, there's more information there. I'm interested, you know, the Democrats did so well on the ballot, uh, and that didn't quite punch through at the State House, and there are new maps in place. 
Can Democrats win a majority in the Senate in this next decade, or is this map locked in for the Republicans? Well, I would point to 2010. Um, and what happened after that election, uh, that map was jerry-rigged to ensure that Democrats never had a majority. And in 2018, we were able um, to gain a majority. I was elected Senate president, and I feel we can do the same thing with this existing map. Fact of the matter is, if you look at the votes cast for state Senate candidates, 52% of those cast in this state were cast for a Democrat. Um, the maps, unfortunately, as they are drawn, precluded us from getting the majority this time around, but we will certainly get the majority in this decade, no question about it. All right, Senate Democratic Leader Donna Susi, thanks for joining us here on Close Up. Thank you again, Adam. We appreciate the time.